We are jumping back into the Psalms today, so we're going to be in Psalm 51. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. And again, if you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand and we will get one to you. Now this psalm, um, many of you probably already know it. This is a very uh, popular psalm for good reason. This is a psalm that is deep and it is beautiful. And what we're going to see today as we go through this psalm is this psalm is going to show us the effect of sin, the beauty of confession and repentance, and the joy of walking in the truth of God. A lot of these truths are foundational. And so the temptation will be to kind of gloss over the things that we already know. But the beauty of this psalm is that it is foundational. These are things that we need to know and hear daily. And so I hope that we come to this psalm with a pure and honest heart, asking God to see us and to reveal to us anything in us that needs to go so that we might be truly blessed as God speaks through me here. So before we dive in, let me pray for us and we'll see what the Lord has to say. Father, we thank you for your love for us and that you do not leave us. You are always with us. Bless us now, Lord, as we come to you in your word. Would you show us the truth? Lord, I thank you that we are all dependent upon you for the truth. Would you reveal to us now, Lord, all that you are and all that we are. If there is any crooked way in us, Lord, anything that is not according to your will, would you reveal it to us? Convict us, Lord, concerning sin and righteousness and free us from the bonds of sin. Help us to not allow sin in our homes, in our hearts, and in our minds, but to always desire to walk in holiness and righteousness. For those who do not know you, Lord, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. Would the lost see just how beautiful the gospel is? Would they see the heart of God, the truth and the beauty of confession and repentance? And would they see the love of Jesus Christ upon the cross for them? For myself, Lord, you know me. You know my need. And I come before you now, Lord, and ask simply that by the power of the Spirit, you would speak to your children to glorify your name to bless them and to sanctify them, that the truth of God will go forth in power, and that all would know the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 All right, family, so this psalm is kind of like Romans 8. It's very thick, it's very pregnant, it's full of theological truths. We could do an eight-week series on this psalm. We won't, but we could. There is so much depth and so much beauty and so much simplicity in what we're going to see. And I pray that what happens is as I go through this, because I'm not going to be able to go as exhaustively as I'd like to, my prayer is that this would wet your whistle a little bit and give you some kind of a hunger to go and do your own study on this psalm for yourself. Let this be in addition to your private time or addition to your quiet time with the Lord, but read through and see the beauty of what we're going to see here today. Again, we're in Psalm chapter 51. If you have your Bible, find me here uh, at the address and then we'll, we'll work our way through here. And it says, for the choir director, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba, after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And here's the beauty of this psalm right off the bat. What we have here in front of us is the word of God. Breathe forth by the Holy Spirit. And the one who is penning these words is King David. Now does he pen these words when he's at the height of his power living in holiness? No. He is actually penning these words after he has committed egregious sin against God and against others. And the beauty of this psalm is that still David's words are in the holy scriptures. Do you understand the beauty of that? It means that David was not disqualified from serving God because of his sin. I pray you know that the same is true for you. And so here in the word of God, breathed forth by the spirit, we have David after he has gone into Bathsheba. And we're going to see three things as we work through this, right? God is going to move in David in three processions or three steps. First, we're going to see confession. Then we're going to see repentance. Now, we must know that the two are very different things. Confession and repentance are very different things. The third thing we're going to see is transformation. Now, the question I want to ask right off the bat today is this. Is there something in your life that is ailing you? Is there something in your life that doesn't sit right with you? Do you feel as though something is missing? Do you feel as though something is not lined up or where it ought to be? Because if you do, I would invite you to come with me through this psalm and see how David responds when there's something in his life that is wrong. Because what I will encourage you with is this, even if something feels wrong in your life, God is always right. And you can always lean in and trust in him. Now we want to get to the depth of this, right? What we're going to see here is what is ailing David is his own sin. 
And often it is the thing that is ailing us, right? In Psalm 32, David says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. We've gone through that psalm already. And David is confessing, man, when I was trying to hide my sin, it was like something was wrong in my body. There was pain, there was anguish, there was hurt, and we've all been through this where we try to hide our own sin and it just doesn't sit right. We're uncomfortable in church, we always feel like the pastor's reading our diary and talking straight to us, right? Something is always going on if there's stuff that we're hiding. And so my, my desire for all of us is that there would be nothing hidden after this message. That we would all come to the Lord in confession and freedom. Now the first thing we're going to see and the first thing that always must be when there is sin is confession. We must confess to the Lord. And that's where we find David here in verse 1. And verse 1 says this. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So the first important thing, and I do mean important thing that we need to see here in this psalm, is David is teaching us how we're supposed to approach God. Now notice David has sin and yet he approaches God in prayer. Now how does he do that or why does he do that? David does not approach God according to his own merit. David does not approach God because he is the king of Israel. He does not approach God because God has anointed him. He does not approach God because of all the mighty works he has done. He approaches God based on the immutable, stable, and reliable character of God. This is why David can come to the Lord it is because God is immutable, God is stable, and God is reliable. We must know and understand this if we are to approach God rightly. Because often, either we approach God with a spirit of pride, thinking we earned or deserved something, or we won't approach God at all because we feel like we have not earned or deserved his presence. And both of those are misunderstandings and misapplications. We approach God according to what he has done. Now, why don't we approach God according to our merit? Anybody? How come we don't come to God according to what we have done? Because it's not super great all the time, yeah? What we do fluctuates. Even why we do the things we do fluctuates, right? Husbands, wives, you know this. Some days you love your spouse because you're just so in love with them. And some days you love your spouse because God said you had to. There's a different motivation when we do certain things, when we serve and when we don't. Sometimes we serve out of guilt because somebody asked and we didn't want to say no. Sometimes we serve because God is moving in our hearts. And so our motives and our actions fluctuate. And that's why we cannot come to God based on our own merit. Does that make sense? We must come to God based on who he is. Now, why do we not understand a lot of people don't understand how to approach God or how we can approach God on his merit, why he would still receive us after sin, and that's usually because we haven't spent enough time with him. Now, please don't hear me say that if there's something wrong in your life, it's a lack of effort on your part. That's not what I'm getting at here. What I'm getting at is if you don't understand that you can approach God always, it may be because you have not approached him enough times to know him, to know that no matter what you do, he will still welcome you into his fold. If you are repentant and you will confess, God is always having his arms open to the prodigal who comes home, regardless of how far they have run. And so we approach God. Notice David asked, Lord, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. This is what David is asking. God, cleanse me and be gracious to me according to who you are, not according to who I am. Because if David asks for compassion based on who he is, let's look at who he is in this moment. He is currently taking somebody else's wife, plotted to kill the man, made other people's accessory to murder, tried to hide it, lie, and get away with it. Should David approach God on those bases? No. That would not be wise of him. And so David here approaches God based on who he is. Now one of the best things in life, family, is to know who you are and to know who God is. Better, I will say, to know who you are because of who God is. If you know who you are because of who God is, that is one of the most freeing and beautiful things that you can experience. And this is why the enemy will always come against you, your identity, and who God is. Because if you can settle those two things, you, like David, can always run back to God. Now, we cannot mix these things up. If we get confused who God is and who we are, we get into all kinds of trouble. We need to understand that we are not God. 
God alone is God. We subject ourselves to him and submit to him because we love him. Now, David here asks God for compassion. He asks God for mercy. He doesn't ask for justice. Why doesn't he ask for justice? <laughs> yeah, we don't even have to talk about that. We know, right? Because he has sinned against the holy God, and if he asks for justice, he will be wiped out. And justice is not what he needs. He needs mercy. Now, I pray that we all have this same heart. When we come to God in our sin, I pray that we are so ready to ask for mercy. More so than that, though, I pray when we see others acting in sin, we are just as quick to ask for mercy. We often want to ask for justice when we see other people committing sin. But if we're quick to ask for justice to others, we better be quick to ask for justice for ourselves. If we are quick to ask for mercy for ourselves, we ought to be quick to ask for mercy for others. Now notice here, he asked God to blot out, to wash, and to cleanse him from three things. His transgression, his iniquity, and his sin. Now we've seen these words before, and here's what I love about David. He made sure he covered all his bases when asking for forgiveness. Forgive me of my transgression, my iniquity, and my sin. Wash me, cleanse me, blot out all of these things, right? He wants to leave no stone left unturned. This is beautiful confession. Now, these words mean different things. The word transgression is the word pasha, and it's talking about a betrayal of a relationship, trust, or a covenant. And we see there that David has betrayed the covenant of marriage with Bathsheba and Uriah, right? It's a deliberate thing, meaning you meant to break or, or bring distrust into this covenant, the word iniquity is the word avon, and it means crookedness, distorting what ought to be straight. God has given David a path in which to walk, and he has steered from that path to go do other things, to do his own desires, to do his own wickedness, right? This is a moral failure. He knew what was right to do, and he did what was wrong. And the word sin is probably the one we're most familiar with. It is the word chata, and it is missing the goal or failing, missing the mark, right? So it's an archery term. So in the, uh, in the Old Testament, they talk about men who could throw stones at a hair and not chata, not miss, uh, not miss the mark, right? Even in the New Testament, it is an archery term meaning to miss. And so what we like to do is this thing where it's sin and then it's kind of sin and then it's almost sin, right? That's not how it works. You hit the target or you don't, right? If, somebody, if you're playing basketball and somebody shoots and it hits the rim 20 times and then bounces out, do you go, well, it was almost two points. Nope. You missed. It's the same thing with sin. There is no almost sin, kind of sin, small sin. We miss the mark. And David here knows that he has missed the mark. Find me here now in verse 3. Let's see how David continues. He says this of himself. I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. David says, I know my transgressions. Family, would that we would have that same mindset. Lord, I know the things that I have failed in. I know the ways that I have missed the mark. I know the ways that I have broken covenant. I know the ways that I've taken which ought to be straight and made them crooked. David gets this from Psalm 14. And Paul also quotes Romans 3, 10 and 23, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I know my transgression. My sin is ever before me. Now, why does he say that? When he said his sin is constantly before him, this confession that he gives comes about a year after he had actually got away with the Bathsheba and Uriah thing. And we know this because David's son is actually born, and that's when Nathan comes to him. So it's been about nine months to a year that David thinks he's gotten away with things. That's when his confession comes. Because the baby had died right a week after this confession. Now, so David comes to the Lord and says, I know my transgression. My sin has ever been before me. What is he talking about here? The weight of carrying that that whole time. The nine months to a year of just carrying this sin, this wickedness. Even when you think you've gotten away with it, there's something in you that knows it ain't right. And you just hide it because you don't want anybody else to find out. And even the I got away with it isn't good because you know like God knows and so this is the weight that David is carrying. John Corson says this, a right view of sin carries with it the understanding that sin deserves judgment. That is why David pleads for mercy rather than justice. He knows that God hates sin. Now, why does God hate sin? One of the many reasons is because of what sin does to us. David sinned, Uriah was dead, Bathsheba was polluted, David was crippled, his family was tainted, sin left nothing but problems, sorrow, and heartache in its wake. That's why God hates sin. Waxer says it this way, 
It's not bad because it's sin. It's sin because it's bad for everyone. We've often said this from this pulpit, your sin never just affects you. Your sin never just affects you. And so it is not bad because it's sin, it is sin because it is bad. And this is why it rocks David and like rots his soul when he's trying to hide all of this stuff. And so he comes to the Lord now in confession. Now verse four, David says something interesting. Verse four, David says, against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. The word judge there is different from condemnation, right? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but God will still judge our actions. Now, David says, against you, God, and you only have I sinned. That seems weird because we can name at least two other people in the immediate context that he has sinned against, namely Bathsheba and Uriah. So this raises a lot of questions. What is he talking about? How could he say this, right? Waxer always says, context plus content equals meaning, right? What is he talking about? How do we know this? So 2 Samuel 12, you don't have to turn there, but I would encourage you to read that. That'll give you some context as to what is being said here. But in this story, Nathan the prophet comes to David and he's speaking on behalf of God and he starts saying stuff like, the sword shall never depart from your house. Evil will be raised up against you from your own household. And then he says, God says, you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. God says you have despised me by sinning against Uriah. And so David in his confession says, Lord, against you and you alone have I sinned. Now we have to pay attention to what David is saying here, right? Remember we had those three uh, definitions, transgression, iniquity, and sin. David was clearly guilty of transgressing, right? He had broken the covenant, the marriage covenant between two people. He was absolutely guilty of iniquity. The straight path God had given to him, he had turned and walked away from it. But when he sinned, when he missed the mark, there is only one who sets the mark for David, and it is God himself. And so when David says, I have only sinned against you, he means you have set me on a course, Lord, and I have denied you, I have missed the mark, I have done all of these things against you and you only. Now, all transgression and all iniquity is sin, but not all sin is transgression and iniquity. There are different things that can happen here. And so David says, God against you and you alone, I have sinned. I have missed the mark. When we read in Matthew 25, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he starts telling them about the people that will be put on his right hand and they will be brought into the, the peace of their master because Jesus says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was sick, right, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in jail, you visited me. And they will say, Lord, when did we do these things? And Jesus will say, when you've done these things to the least of these, my brethren, you have done them unto me. And so why then does David say he has sinned against God? It is because God literally takes the sins of his people and places them upon himself. God also takes the sins done against his people and takes them on himself. So it's not just your sin that you do that God takes for you. All the sins that are done against you your God literally takes them upon himself. And so when David sins against Uriah, God steps in and says, you have sinned against me. And so this is David understanding that his sin ultimately has one end and it is God. And so family, when you and I sin, ultimately it is always against God. The holy God who loves you and sent his son for you. This is why we cannot minimize sin in our lives. I will always encourage you family to call sin what it is. We want to try to minimize sin, use different language so it doesn't hit us as hard, right? I stumbled, I made a mistake, I failed. Family, if we minimize sin, we will treat it with minimal effort. If we call sin what it is, we will hunt and kill it as we ought to because it is destroying us. And so when we sin, family, I encourage you, call it what it is, sin. Because by then, can you confess your sin to God and be cleansed from all unrighteousness? Now, David here is going to give us a little bit of a commentary on who he is and where he has come from. So find me in verse 5. David says this, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Now, this is one of those verses that makes people uncomfortable. 
right? Modern moralists and people who want to kind of do away with the sin nature try to skip over this verse, but it is very clear here in the text. David says, I was brought forth in iniquity and conceived in sin. So before he was even born, when he was conceived, there was this sin nature. And we don't like this, this terminology, right? Because especially when we look at babies, we, they see these like beautiful and cute and innocent little things right up until they can talk. And then it's kind of, it's, it's a gray area, right? <laughs> Scripture is telling us here, we are born with this sin nature. We are born with this likeness of Adam. Adam who rebelled against God, right? There is this sin nature in us. Now, David is not saying, you know, his mom was sleeping around or that she was a prostitute or something like that. And that's why he was brought forth. It is the very nature by which he is conceived. He was born a sinner and at no time in David's life is he without sin. Is he absent of sin? This is something that he is dealing with all the while he is king. It is something we deal with all the while in our lives. Now, this includes, right, everybody being born in sin. This includes Uriah and Bathsheba. We tend to do this thing where, like, we, we try to make one party guilty and the other party innocent. And in this one situation, that may be true. But it doesn't mean Uriah was without sin. Nor was Bathsheba without sin. Right? Because what does Romans 3.23 tell us? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if we're taking what David is saying here is we were born and conceived in sin and iniquity. Then from when we are children, there is this sin nature. Now here's why I'm bringing this point up. It is because in the world that we live in, this is a common phrase that you will hear. Well, I was born this way. I have always done this. This is just how I am. And that word and that, those phrases are thrown out to justify whatever actions we want. Well, I have always felt this way or I was born this way or this is just who I am and I say that to justify I'm not going to be how you want me to be or how God wants me to be, right? I have always had this natural bend or propensity toward this thing, therefore it must be okay. Here's the problem with this. If we have a natural bend towards sin and it harms and kills us and God calls us away from it, it is not to our best interest to continue in sin. Now this is something that the world is buying into more and more. I just saw an interview. This man was talking to a bunch of people and he was saying like, look, I will never get married to and be faithful to one woman because it is against my biological nature. My biology tells me I'm not supposed to be faithful to one woman and so I'm just gonna go ahead and sleep around. What he was saying is, I was born this way. So I should be able to do whatever it is I want to do. I was born with these desires, therefore it should be good for me to surrender to them. That's the logic of the day that we live in. Now is this true? No. We know this and the world knows this. Right? If someone is born with a propensity towards substance abuse, should we then just go, well, that's what you want. If someone is born with a propensity toward anger, toward violence, do we just allow them to exercise those things? No. If someone is born with a propensity to lie or to steal, you see what I'm saying? We can't just do this thing where we go, well, I, this is a natural thing for me, therefore it must be okay. We are all called to take the flesh captive. To not obey our, our natural lusts and desires, but to have self-control, right? Fruit of the Spirit, self-control. And so we cannot just live by what we desire for ourselves. We have to ask the question, what does God desire for us? I know what I want to do. What does God desire for me? And that's what we're going to find in verse 6. Verse 6 says this. Behold, you, talking about God, desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. And so God desires truth. Where? In here. In us. In the depth of who we are. In our innermost being, he desires truth and he desires wisdom. Now family, we just said earlier, if you know who God is and you know who you are, it is a blessing. And I cannot overstate that enough. If you know God and you know his truth, there is such peace. There is such joy. There is such a firm foundation to stand on. But if you do not have truth, you will see a lot of what you're seeing in the world today. There is an assault on the truth in the world. There is, there is this thought going around that there is no such thing as objective truth. 
that everything is subjective, you decide for yourself what is right and what is wrong and all of this, and you wanna know why that's a problem? It's because people cannot agree on nothing. And if it's all about your truth and my truth and their truth and what? How do we know what is true? How do we know what to stand on? God desires that we know the truth, right? Not just that we know the truth outside of us, meaning, yeah, yeah, I know what's true, but I don't want that. We have to know the truth outside of us and within us. We have to know what is true and live what is true. And this is why we have to understand the difference between my truth and the truth. My truth is irrelevant if it contradicts the truth. If I go into a math class and say one plus one is four, and the teacher says, you're wrong, and I say to him, well, that's my truth, should the teacher then go, well, okay, here's your A. No, if the teacher is any good, he will continue to show me why I am wrong and help me to understand the truth. Because there, if there isn't a truth, it is chaos. God has given us the truth. And so we've known this from the Garden of Eden, right? We want to decide what is right and wrong for ourselves. We want to tell God what is right and what is wrong. This happened in the Garden of Eden and is happening today. The world wants to tell God what is right and wrong. The world wants to actually take God and make him in their image. The problem is a God made in our own image can never save us. A God who looks like us is not a God worth worshiping because we know we're not worth worshiping. We must know the truth. We make ourselves in our own image rather than being satisfied with the image that God has given to us. We want to define our own rules rather than trusting the things that God has laid out for our protection, right? And so in the world that we live in today, you'll see a lot of this going on. I wish to identify myself as this, this, or that. I don't care what God has said. I don't care what God has made me to be. I don't care what God has designed this covenant to be. I have made my own decision. God cannot tell me dot, dot, dot. Now this happens all over the board, right? This happens even in marriage. I will love my wife like Christ loved the church when she dot, dot, dot. I encourage you to open your Bible and try to find that stipulation. Because it doesn't say, husbands, love your wife like Christ loves the church if she dot, dot, dot. The commandment is for you. Well, that's, that's what I want to be. That's how I'm going to define marriage. Right? I want to identify as this gender or that gender. Family, God has created you with intent and purpose. Please hear me when I say this. He has intentionally formed you in the womb. You are beautifully and wonderfully made by the hand of a perfect, all-loving, all-knowing creator. And yet we rebel against his love and his design for what we want. And this pains me. Because to rebel against God's desire for you is to run from that which is best for you. And I don't care what it is. If you're running against God, you are not running in a good direction. God's desire is for your greatest joy because in that is his greatest glory. But what does Satan want to tell you? God's keeping something from you. He won't let you identify as what you want to because he's keeping something from you. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God desires your joy and your peace. Family, there's this thought that if, if the word of God goes against my desires, then the word of God must be wrong. If the word of God goes against what I think it is, there, it must be something wrong with the interpretation. No. If you and God disagree, guess who's wrong? <laughs> it's not God. You get one guess. Family, God is the almighty creator who has spoken truth and who is truth. Jesus says of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through Jesus. He also says when he prays to the Father, Lord, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. We must know God's truth, and society is dying because they lack the truth. Society is dying because they lack the truth. And here's a very real example of what I'm talking about here. When it comes to our transgender family in the world, people that we want to love and care for, 
There's a study that came out that said someone who has gone through transgender surgery, so sex change surgery or something like that, their suicide rate is 19 times higher than that of their peers. 19 times higher. Now I understand this is a touchy subject, but if people that I love have a higher chance of harming themselves or a higher mortality rate and I say nothing, how can I say that I love them? How can I profess my love for you if I just stand by and champion the thing that is killing you, that is pulling you away from God, that is buying you into the lie of Satan? Family, Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, and even David himself realizes there must be truth within us. God desires truth in our innermost being, in anything that we do. And so what then is the proper response? If it is not to give in to our natural desires, what then is the proper response? Do we surrender to our natural inclinations? No. The proper response is repentance. The proper response when we see our sin before us is to repent. Notice verse 7 here. David prays this. Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Now when he's talking about hyssop, this is not a random request. David is not just naming plants, right? Purify me with whatever. The hyssop has a very purposeful use here in the text. This is from Exodus, right? The first Passover. It says, you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood, which is in the basin, and apply it to some of the blood that is in the basin, on the lintel and on the two doorposts, on the top and on the sides. None of you shall go outside the door of the house until morning. And so this hyssop is used to apply the blood of protection on the homes, right? So it's a, it's a thing where the blood is applied for protection. David understood what the writer of Hebrews would later repeat. And he says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so what we see here is the hyssop is used to apply the blood of the lamb to protect the people of God. And this is so beautiful and so powerful when you read of the crucifixion of Jesus because John 19 says this, a jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. This same branch that was used to apply the blood of protection is now being extended to the lamb so that he would take this cup for you and for me. And so if we apply David's request here to the Lord, he says, purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Now when he asks for purification, who is he asking? God. He's asking God to purify him. Why? because only God can purify him. Amen. Family, you and I, we cannot purify ourselves. We cannot make ourselves right before the Lord. If we could, we would have done it a long time ago. God alone is the one who purifies us. So then and now it is the work of the Lord and not the work of the flesh to purify us from all unrighteousness. Now check out verse eight. David's prayer is starting to shift and, and adjust here. Verse eight says, make me to hear joy and gladness. Notice how sin blocks out joy and gladness. Notice he's got to confess his sins and ask to be cleansed before he can ask, make me hear joy and gladness, right? Some of us have been in this place where we're sitting in worship and everybody around us is having a great time and we're just not. And we don't know why. And then God reveals it to us. Sin will block out your joy, it will block out your gladness. Notice again in verse eight, it says this, David says, let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Who broke the bones? God did. Hold up. Why is God breaking David's bones? Because David is acting up. Because David thought he could run and not confess his sin for a year. And so there are these broken bones. Now, remember this about broken bones. When they heal, they heal stronger. And so why then does God break David? Because he loves David. Why would God reveal to any of us our sin and break us over our sin? Hebrews 12. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Amen. Yet to those who have been trained by it, meaning discipline, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Why does God break David's legs? to make him righteous. Why does he break his bones? So that he will be cleansed of all unrighteousness and made clean. This is part of the process. Look now at verse nine. David asked something of the Lord. 
And he says, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. So he's made this request before, right? Cleanse me, wash me, blot these things out. But notice he says, hide your face from my sins. Then in verse 10, he says, create in me a clean heart, O God. The word create is the word bara. It's the same one in Genesis where it says to create, God created the heavens and the earth to create something from nothing, right? And so within himself, David has just asked God <clears throat> to create in him a clean heart. To bring forth out of nothing this clean heart. And I think it's because David knows he ain't got one. It's not this thing where like, oh, it's a little bit stained, just clean it up. God, create in me, give to me this clean heart. Now, why does he ask God to do this? Because it is God's job to do this. It is God's job to cleanse us, to make us whole, and to make us right. What this means is, it is not about you working harder. When you sin, it is not about you working harder to get back to God. It is not about you trying more, suffering more, taking more things from yourself. It is about you running to the only one who can cleanse you. And if you run to anything else, even your own effort, you will not be cleansed. You will be frustrated, but you will not be cleansed. None but God, from Spurgeon, none but God can create a new earth and a new heart. God is the only one who can create both of these things. David needs his heart to be clean because he cannot have communion with God while it's not. There have been many people that I've talked to that have had sin in their lives and just simply going up to the table there and taking communion has been something they could not do. They could not sit there and break the bread and drink the cup because they knew there was sin. They could not have communion with the one that they loved most because there was something there and that's why David says, Lord, clean me. Give me a clean heart so that I can renew this relationship. And not only that, he asked God to renew a steadfast spirit within me. Now the question on the table is, who or what can renew your spirit? Now we all know the answer, but let me just throw some other things out just in case. Can a drink renew your spirit? It can change your attitude a little bit maybe, but can it renew your spirit? No. What about surfing? What about playing, doing things that you love? Can those things renew your spirit? No, they can make you feel pretty good for a little bit, but they cannot renew your spirit. What about a relationship? Maybe if I'm finally with this person, then my spirit will be renewed. Unless that relationship is with the Lord Almighty, it's not gonna cleanse your spirit. It's not gonna renew this spirit in you. The only thing that can renew your spirit is a clean heart. When your heart is clean, it is refreshing. And only... Jesus can give you a clean heart. Only Jesus. And so what then is the fruit of a clean heart? It is a steadfast spirit. Steadfast, firmly fixed, in place, immovable, not subject to change. A steadfast spirit is a solid spirit. It is a steady spirit. You know those people in your life that are just the same no matter what is going on? They're steadfast. They're immovable. God is this way, and so our spirit also ought to be this way, but it must come from a clean heart. Now David here in verse 11 prays this to God, and this is an interesting prayer. He says, do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now it's interesting because usually it's us walking away from God, right? We walk away from his presence, or we try to, right, like Jonah. Jonah tried to flee from the presence of the Lord. How'd that go for Jonah? Not super great, right? Jonah should know you cannot flee from the Lord, but he tried to run from his presence. David here actually prays, Lord, don't take it from me. David is giving us an insight here, and that insight is holiness will not partner with sin and compromise. David knows he has sinned and there's compromise in his life, and this is why he's asking God, God, please don't leave me. Do not take your presence from me. Do not take your spirit from me. Isaiah 59 says this, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save. Neither is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that 
he does not hear. Sin and iniquity separate us from the face of God, from the presence of God, from the spirit of God. When he asks, do not take your Holy Spirit from me, this verse should sober us up. That it's even possible for this question to be asked. Do not take your spirit from me. Now here's the difference, right? The spirit upon us, or epi, right, in the Greek, and the spirit in us, and are two very different things. The spirit upon us is the power of God so that we have boldness and agape love and living holy lives. The spirit in us is a byproduct of being believers. And so as believers, does the spirit leave us when we sin from within us? No, otherwise the spirit would be moving all day. But the spirit of God is removed from upon us when we sin. The spirit of God can be taken from upon us, not from within us. So when you feel like in your life you have no power, you have no peace, you have no joy, there is a restlessness in you, there seems to be no fruit of God in you, it may be because the Spirit of God has been taken from upon you. But the Spirit of God in you will beckon you back to the one who can restore you. And that is the beauty of God. He says, he will never leave us. Hebrews 13, 5, he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. And so praise God that he does not move his spirit from within us, but he wants us, to move, he wants us to understand the spirit being not upon us so that we can feel what it is to run from him. We must come back to God. Verse 12, David asks this, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Now was David's salvation lost? No, not at all, but his joy was. And that's why he asked God to restore the joy of his salvation. Here's a secret for us. If ever you're feeling dry or worn down or like God is far away, I want you to remember the day of your salvation. Think on that day. Think on who you were before that day. Think on who you were after that day. I pray it is a very different thing. Yes. Family, the day that you realized I am sinful, I am covered in iniquity and only God can rescue me. And then you heard, yeah, he loves you, sent his son to die for you, take all your sin and shame upon himself and you get to have his righteousness. Go be blessed. I pray that you remember that day and it wells you up with the joy of God's salvation. Because that ought to bring you joy. That the God of all creation loved and gave you salvation. Joy is the pure byproduct of true and lasting forgiveness. If you know that you are forgiven for your sins, there is a real joy that comes. You ever go pray with somebody, confess, cry, I'm the worst, hanabadas, bugas, all that stuff, and then you calm down and you go to worship? Whoo, hands up high, baby. Because there is a joy in us that we have been so loved and so forgiven. Now, Christian, I need you to understand this. You are loved but you are not entitled. You are loved, but you are not entitled. And our society is doing everything to teach you the opposite. That you are entitled, but you are not loved. Christian, you are loved, but you are not entitled. Entitlement does this thing in us where we lose our thanksgiving and we actually start demanding things from God. That's when we start asking God, God, how come you haven't this? Or how come you didn't that? We lose our thankfulness and the joy of what he has already given us and we become actually bitter toward God for what he hasn't given us yet. That's an entitlement. If you ever catch yourself being entitled, remember where you came from. That would be the dirt. And from the dirt, God has taken you and made you his child and his treasure. That should make you thankful. We come to God with thanksgiving. You and I have been given a gift in God's unconditional love. We've been given a gift in his forgiveness. We've been given a gift in his salvation. That is the good news of the gospel, and that should bring us joy. It has all been a gift. He says here again in this verse, sustain me with a willing spirit. Notice he has to ask God to sustain him because he knows he can't sustain himself. And if you ever think you can't sustain yourself, Quick reality check, you can't. But God himself can sustain you and David knows he needs God's help. Psalm 55, 22 says this, cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. When it's the Lord sustaining you, you'll have this willing spirit or this free spirit 
And this is what we must have. So David here, at some point, became indifferent to his sins, just kind of whatever about it. Now he's coming to the Lord and realizing, I need an overhaul. There needs to be this whole new thing in me. You've got to take away all the old and give me all the new. Now he's asked God to give him a steadfast and a willing spirit, a spirit that is firmly fixed in place and is free to worship and love God. So this is the repentance that we have seen in David. Now we're going to see the transformation. So he's asked God to give him all of this in repentance and confession. Now we're going to see David transformed. Verse 13. He says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. What I love about this is the people who are in touch with their own depravity and are free to receive the fullness of God's forgiveness to them are the people who want to tell other people about Jesus. The people who want to go and testify are the people who have tasted and seen the goodness of the Lord's forgiveness. I know I'm a sinner. I know I need grace. I know God has made me his child, and I got to tell somebody. This is thing that stirs up in us, right? If, let's say, like you guys, you know, those of you who are trying to pay off your homes or, you know, you got mortgages and stuff, imagine if somebody came and just paid that all for you. Just said, here, I got you. Just gave you however much money you need to pay off your house. Would your response be, oh, right on. <laughs> Mahalo. If you were wrongly accused of murder and you were on trial and they were going to sentence you and somebody took your sentence for you and said, no, I'll go for them, would you go, Psst, about time. <laughs> or would you just be the most thankful person in all creation? You're going to pay for my house? Thank you. You're going to take my sentence? Why would you do that for me? I'm so unworthy. Family, this is the thankfulness that we give to the God of all creation who bought us with his blood. Amen. This is the beauty of being restored to the joy of our salvation. God, you have more than paid my debt. You have more than pardoned my sentence. You have given me so much. Thank you, God. Restore to me the joy of my salvation, and then I'm going to go tell somebody. I got to tell somebody. If somebody paid off your house, you would tell everybody. You'd be posting it all over the place and calling people and all that fun stuff. But too often we forget the joy of our salvation. We get caught up with all the other things and bogged down with all the other drama. John Corson says this, If you repent before the Lord, just as he promised to restore the years the locusts had eaten, He'll open up entirely new aspects of ministry to you. For you will be able to speak with authority and conviction about the inexhaustible goodness and grace of God. If we see and understand and appreciate God, we got to tell somebody. We want to bless other people. We want to share with them the joy that we have received. So we're going to tell other people like David. Find me here in verse 14. Ooh. Verse 14. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. David says here, Lord, I am guilty of death for I have sinned and he asks for deliverance. And then he says, my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. David has to ask God for help in worshiping him. God, you've done all of this stuff. Now open my mouth. Help me to worship you. Now we need help. We do. Why? Because we get distracted. We get tired. We get sleepy. We start wondering how long the sermon is going to go, right? And so David here has to ask, Lord, help me to worship you. Now, external praise is a genuine byproduct of understanding the truth of God, right? According to Jesus, whoever has been forgiven much, loves much. When we understand the depth of our forgiveness, the worship comes all the more natural, right? Right? When we forget how much we're forgiven, we're short with others, we're slow to anger, all of that stuff. John Piper says this, and John Piper knows a thing or two about the joy of the Lord. The Bible says the aim of our singing is to raise sounds of joy. No one in the universe has more joy than God. Amen. He is infinitely joyful. God's joy is unimaginably powerful. He is God when he speaks, galaxies come into being. And when he sings for joy, more energy is released than exists in all the matter of motion of the universe. If he appointed song for us to release our hearts the light in him, is this not because he also knows the joy of releasing his own heart's delight in his own image, in his son, by his spirit in song? We are a singing people because we are a children of a singing God. Why do we worship God with song? He sings over us. 
when Jesus came, he sang hymns. We are a people of song because our hearts are welled up to joy and we must proclaim and sing. I am running out of time here, so let's uh, go to verse 16. Verse 16 says, of God, you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Real quickly, I want you to turn with me to Luke 18. Luke chapter 18, it'll be in your New Testament. You'll see Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Luke chapter 18. And find me in verse nine. Luke 18, nine. I'm gonna read this parable for us. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is what David is saying here in verse 18 when it says, God does not delight in sacrifices. He delights in a broken and contrite heart. Right, so when we come to God with our sacrifices, God, I go to church, I tithe, I pray, I do my quiet time, I do all this kinds of stuff. Thank you that I'm not like other people. He will not hear that prayer, but he will hear of the prayer of the one who says, Lord, be merciful to me, for I have sinned against you. The broken and contrite heart is a heart of worship. Find me here now in the last two verses, 18 and 19. It says, by your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. David here has been asked to be cleansed of all this sin, all this unrighteousness, all this, all this iniquity. And then he says, we will offer these things to you. Sin affects our work for God. So if all of the stuff we've already talked about is not enough to convince you to rid, the self, rid yourself of sin, sin will affect your working for God. David was king. He was leader of his nation. He was the chosen and appointed one of God. And the hidden sin in him was affecting his entire nation. God would not take their sacrifices. He would not receive their worship and their blessings because his sin affected everyone. The work that God wanted to do, he would not hear. Remember in Malachi when God is saying to his people, I want your hearts. Close your doors. Stop having your festivals. Stop doing these things. I don't want them. I want your hearts. And when God has our hearts, worship is true. Worship is beautiful and it is real. And so family, if the joy within us is gone, chances are there's some unconfessed and unrepentant sin in our lives. There is something there that is hindering us from true worship. So if the spirit of God is flowing in us to bring us to this place to cleanse us, then there will be a true joy and a true peace. We will receive the grace of God. And so for us, I pray that we see David's layout here. Again, there's so much more for you to go and find on your own. But I pray that we see David come to God, a broken sinner, at the beginning of this psalm, and then leave the end of this psalm saying, we're just going to worship you. You have cleansed me, Lord. You have shown me my iniquity. You have blessed me with a new heart, a solid spirit, and now I want to tell somebody. Now I want to be free to worship and to serve, family. This is the end of understanding the beauty of this psalm. And so if anyone in here today has sin that they are hiding, you are not hiding it from the only one that matters. God sees that sin. Be rid of it. Be free from it. I pray that all of us, as we pray, would ask God, if there's any sin in me, show me. If there's anything I'm missing, reveal it to me because I want nothing to hinder my relationship with you, my ability to rejoice and to praise and to have joy for you. And so family, if you do have sin that you need to get off your chest, we're gonna have prayer team members on both sides of the stage. Come, talk to us. I promise you nobody you're gonna confess your sin to is gonna go, oh, I've never sinned before, this is new. They are people who love you and who understand that they also need that freedom. Aloha, I'm Gordon, and I'm the director of children's ministry here at One Love. And I want to say thank you for tuning in today. We hope that you are inspired and strengthened by today's celebration. 
If you're new to OneLove, we encourage you to visit us online at onelove.org and fill out a Connect card so we can keep you up to date with all the things that are happening here. While you're there, you can also learn more about One Love, submit prayer requests, or see more of our studies through the Bible. There are many ways to stay connected, so we encourage you to take that first step. If you're watching today's celebration via YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe to our channel and click that bell icon to keep informed with new messages. Most importantly, if you made a decision to follow Christ today, we encourage you to click on the I Said Yes to Christ link at the bottom of our website and fill the form so we can stay connected. One last thing, if you want to learn more about the good news of Jesus Christ, we encourage you to visit goodnewshawaii.com. There you'll find five short videos about living a life in Christ and a free discipleship booklet designed to encourage your new faith. Mahalo for tuning in to One Love Today. We hope you were blessed by our time together. Aloha.